Good evening, uh, welcome, and thanks very much for coming. I'm Bradley Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine, and on behalf of everybody at, at PNP and here at GW and, and Axios uh, as well, uh, we're, we're very glad that, uh, that you're here. You know, putting on an event like this involves lots of people. Thanks first goes to the folks here at George Washington University and Lisner Auditorium. We at PNP have been working with Lisner for a number of years now to present large events with popular authors, and we're very grateful to be able to have access to such a spacious and convenient facility right here in uh, downtown DC. Our appreciation also to Axios, the news and analysis site that has joined in sponsoring this event. Since its official launch last year, Axios has become a fresh competitive addition to Washington's journalism scene covering media trends, tech, business, and politics on an innovative platform. Axios, GW, and PNP are all very pleased to be presenting James Comey this evening. The former FBI director has certainly been very much in the news since the release a couple of weeks ago of his book, A Higher Loyalty, appearing on news programs, talk shows, and stages around the country. He's detailed the controversial decisions in the 2016 campaign that he, that he made as the nation's top law enforcement officer and his subsequent interactions with President Trump, who famously fired him a year ago. He's also recounted stories from his childhood in New York and New Jersey, his college years at William and Mary, and his distinguished career, which has alternated between increasingly senior jobs uh, in the US Justice Department and positions in private practice with, with such firms as Lockheed Martin and Bridgewater Associates. Mr. Comey says he never expected to write a book, but eventually chose to do so to drive a conversation about ethical leadership and our nation's core values. He's called President Trump out of step with those values, comparing him to a mob boss who stresses personal loyalty over the law and has little regard for morality or truth. Not surprisingly, the president has had some choice words for Mr. Comey, calling him a leaker and a liar, among other derogatory epithets. Meanwhile, sales of a higher loyalty keep going up. <laughs> and, and tickets for events like this one sell out in minutes. This evening, you'll get a chance to see and hear Mr. Comey in person and form your own impressions without a filter. You'll be in conversation with Mike Allen, one of Washington's most prominent and tireless journalists. Mike wrote for the Washington Post and a couple of other news organizations before launching the daily newsletter playbook at Politico just over a decade ago. He left Politico in 2016 to help establish Axios, where he's now executive editor and author every morning of the newsletter Axios AM. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming James Comey and Mike Allen. Thank you, Brad. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Brad. We so admire the business that you and Lissa have built, uh, Politics and Prose, a great growing independent bookstore uh, here in the nation's uh, capital just opened at the wharf, coming soon to Union Market, and your son Cole is here. So uh, Brad and Melissa, thanks for making this possible. Uh, Mr. Director, backstage, you told me that there's something you hope to never do again in your life. Wear a tie. <laughs> and then one of my daughters reminded me she's getting married in July, and I'll have to wear a tie. So. Uh, you've got your wish uh, till then. And uh, you were saying that uh, through all this rollout, all the different types of events that you've done, uh, you and I were both encouraged, walked in, saw the amazing line. Today we've got, uh, there's a very uh, involved audience. We've got a big fat stack of questions already. You said you like a live audience. Yeah. Because of the instant feedback, if you're not making sense, you can hear it in the burbling in the audience. If you, if you actually made sense, you hear that as well. It's fun and also useful to get that kind of interaction. Now, Brad was referring to the president's tweets, and at your book party uh, the other night, uh, one of the first people who was thanked was 
President Trump. They thank President Trump for his support for all his tweeting. Were you surprised that he's been driving up your sales like this? <laughs> it was not I who. <laughs> it was not I who thanked him for uh, tweeting at me. That was Matt Latimer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, so I wish he wouldn't be tweeting at me. I don't know what effect it's had on book sales. I've been blown away and a little freaked by the the rate at which it's selling, but uh, that makes me happy. But uh, did you think he would resist? Like with Michael Wolff, he kind of learned. Like he did lots for Michael Wolff's uh, retirement fund. Yeah, I, did, I didn't know whether he resists or not. I, I, I said once that I'm kind of like a breakup that he can't get over for some reason. <laughs> and, he, and I'm out there living my best life, and he wakes up tweeting at me. Uh, so before we plunge in, I want to thank all of you for coming out. I had a great time uh, visiting with some of you. I want to thank our friends at the George Washington University and Listener Auditorium, this amazing space, uh, as Brad said. Uh, two great young entrepreneurs, Keith Urban and Matt Latimer of Javelin. I call them the maestros. Uh, they pulled all this uh, together. Uh, thank you, C-SPAN. Uh, C-SPAN is carrying this live. Uh, Director Comey, with all the interviews you've done, this is the first one C-SPAN has carried live. So thank you, uh, C-SPAN. Uh, Marlena Bittner, the Executive Director of Publicity at Flatiron Books. And thank you to all my colleagues at Axios who helped uh, pull this off. Director Comey, as you got in that media spin cycle of this rollout, what did you learn about yourself and what did you learn about the media? Hmm. I learned that I don't love uh, being recognized on the street and airports and bathrooms and elevators and all kinds of other places. Well, when you're 6'8". Yeah, that's the, my, my wife says I should be in a wheelchair with a straw hat. Uh, but that, that, um, that's not something that I uh, crave or thrive on. It actually makes me slightly uncomfortable, although people are very nice. What I've learned about the media is a whole lot of people ask questions about a book they have not read. <laughs> so uh, there will be a quiz. Uh, so uh, Director Comey, this book is largely about leadership, and I think that part of your original idea of the genesis was a leadership book. Help us with this leadership paradox. How do you be confident enough to be humble? It requires enough sense of self a basic uh, conviction that I'm okay, that also allows you to realize I'm not okay enough, and gives you the comfort to learn from other people and show the humility that's necessary to listen to other people. And so it requires this balance. Too much confidence and it swaps, you know, swipes uh, humility off the board. Too much insecurity makes it impossible to listen and to learn from others. So what I mean when I use that term is a comfort in yourself that also allows you to realize you're not good enough and the path to getting better is learning from other people. And what ingredient would you say is most often missing from leaders or maybe was most often missing from your bosses? Humility. That, that I, I've known a lot of leaders and seen a lot of leaders. Actually, I think overconfidence is one of the great challenges of human existence, but especially in leadership. And they were so challenged in learning from those of us below them and in taking joy in our achievements. Actually, I think that's the key to being a good parent, too, is not to compete with your children, but to learn that you should take joy from how they do. And so that, that missing balance, the leavening, the confidence, you got to have confidence to be a leader, but you have to have a measure of humility to balance it out and to allow you to be better engaging with the people who work for you. Now, you're going to be uh, teaching a course on leadership and ethics at the college of William and Mary. What is your one rule or lesson for ethics? What is the one thing I can keep in mind to make a spot decision when I have to? The most important thing, I think, is to ask yourself the sort of the golden rule, which is a theme that runs through all the world's religions, is am I treating this other as I would want to be treated? Is for me the most important touchstone. Lots of other rules, but to me that's the, the reason it's called the golden rule. That's the, that should be at the core of it. One more question about role models. Who in this whole Russia thing has been a model of good behavior? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, that's a great question. I'd have to look to the government side for that, Mike. Uh, I admire and I write in the book, which I hope you get a chance to read, that Jim Clapper is the leader in government that I most admired. 
because he had that balance of confidence and humility. Another pair I talk about a lot is he was both tough and kind. And I think he, I saw that throughout my interaction with him, including during the, the 2016 election and thereafter. So Axios always starts with the news. We'll start with the news. And by the way, uh, we hope you'll follow along in the conversation. Hashtag Axios Comey. Axios hashtag, uh, hashtag Axios Comey uh, will uh, uh, be an ongoing conversation. If you were negotiating with President Trump's legal team on the terms of an interview, which is what's going on right now, what would you insist on? So I'm the prosecutor. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Again. Right, again. <laughs> uh, I would, in any interview with a subject, I would want to make sure that I had unlimited time, uh, a clear understanding, and I would look to negotiate away any boundaries, because I need to be able to ask any follow-up questions that I wish, and then I'd want to make sure there was a clear understanding on the part of the subject of the interview that whether or not it was within the grand jury, still a false statement would be prosecutable, and those would be the key things. Open-ended as to time, open-ended as to subject, and a clear understanding that you are obligated to tell the truth, and, and failing to do so will be at your peril. Do you believe that in the end, the special counsel will interview President Trump? I do not know. I don't know. I hope that the special counsel is free to gather all the information that he needs to get to truth. I don't know what the truth will be. I don't care, so long as he gets to truth. and. It's hard in, in almost all investigations to imagine getting to that without some interaction with the subject. But whether he gets it or not, I hope he's free to get to the truth. If you got President Trump under oath, what would you ask him? Hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think I can answer that, Mike, because one of the things I've been careful not to do is to talk about what I know about the Russia investigation? You're, you're, you're a private citizen. You read the papers. You're a big news yeah, yeah. consumer. What are you curious about? What would you like to know that the president could answer? I would want to know as much as I could about the facts around things like his interaction with me on February the 14th, because to understand whether there's an obstruction case there, setting aside the legal question of whether one can be brought against the sitting president, I'd want to understand state of mind. And as I've said, I think, to the frustration of some journalists, I don't know the answer to that. I can recount a conversation I have, but I don't know what was in his head. And so if I were the interviewer, I'd want to ask lots of questions to get around that topic and explore it as deeply as I could. So what is your gut, given the facts that we do know? Does it look like? President Trump obstructed justice? My answer is I don't know. And I, I can't responsibly answer that question, because it, it requires an understanding of facts that I can't see from where I sit, that what was to understand his state of mind, the investigator want to go all the way around that, understand communications before and after that, what's the written record, lots of things that prevent me from being able to be anything other than a witness. You write in the book. It, it's very possible that uh, neither he nor his campaign illegally colluded with Russia. Very possible they did not. Sure. First of all, collusion is not a thing in the world of, <laughs> of the government investigators and prosecutors. I don't know how that actually got into our lexicon. But it, the question is, is there evidence that Americans conspired with the Russians or aided and abetted the Russians? And you're their... very skeptical that there is. Well, I'm not. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm skeptical by nature, and that was the subject of an FBI investigation that had been going on and was ongoing at the time I was fired, and so I don't know what it's come up with. Again, if left alone, I'm confident this group of investigators and prosecutors will find out what that truth is, but I don't know the answer. In retrospect, given what you wrote in your memos, should you have resigned before you were fired? No, definitely not. And because I led an organization that is supposed to be both in the executive branch and not quite of the executive branch, independent-minded, independent in its decisions about facts and investigations. And so I thought my discomfort in my interactions with President Trump made it more important for me to stay. And so I would not have resigned. So uh, I asked uh, readers of Axios AM for questions for you, hundreds of them answered. One of them was, do you think the people who are morally opposed to the president can serve him? Can serve him? 
Yes. The question is in what capacity, at what cost to yourself, because I do believe that anyone close will be stained. And what was the cost to you? Were you stained? I don't, I was fired. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I don't think I was stained. Obviously it's tough to be trapped in yourself. I don't think so. But it, the other thing that people have to do and I, is they have to make a calculation, not a calculation, they have to be keenly aware of the point at which they would move from serving the country to enabling conduct that they would find morally objectionable. And that's a judgment that each individual has to make themselves. What critique of you is most fair? Critique of me is most fair. I actually don't think the stuff about sanctimony is fair. Saint Comey? Yeah, you'd have to know me better to know that. I, I have a number of weaknesses that I wrestle with. I've worked very hard during my life growing up with great help from my wife and family to make sure that I'm not making decisions driven by ego. But uh, I think probably the best, the fairest critique of me is probably that I can be stubborn and maybe that I can make decisions too quickly. I don't think that I did here. I think I have a risk sometimes that I can convince myself of being decisive when I'm being impulsive. And I try to guardrail that with the team I keep around me to say, wait a minute. But that's, those are fair critiques of me. I actually don't see those emerging, for example, in the Clinton email thing because of the guardrails I had around me in the team. Uh, but th that's, those are my two answers. Here's a question from a Hillary supporter. You told the senators that when you heard or considered that you might have tipped the election, you were mildly nauseous. And this person said, I really was looking for more like mortified, horrified. Could you do a little more than mildly nauseous if you tipped an American election? I can't. I guess you'd have to experience my sense of nausea, but it, <laughs> uh, it, it makes me feel sick to my stomach. And so, and one of my kids pointed out, as you know, I should have said nauseated there if I were going to be grammatically correct. <laughs> but look, the answer, and, and maybe part of it is, I sure hope not. And, and maybe that, maybe I'd feel more physical pain if I convinced myself that we absolutely did. But it makes me sick to think that we might have had any impact because our whole, our lives are devoted to these institutions that have no role there. And we're stuck in the middle of it. And if the idea that we had an impact is, Sickening. But you accept that you may have tipped the election? It's possible. I don't know. And secretly, I hope that someday really smart academics come up with some you know, explanation that rules out that the FBI had any impact. I honestly don't know. And part of what makes it nausea-inducing is, it, it, even looking back, it wouldn't change the choices or the way I think about those choices. They really sucked. And and the fact that it might have an impact just adds to the pain. It doesn't change how I think about what we faced. Sometimes you're stuck with bad or worse, and you always have to choose bad over worse. You write in a higher loyalty about Rudy Giuliani, who's your boss. Yep. And what is the effect of the president hiring Mayor Giuliani for his legal team? I don't know. Why do you think he did? I suppose it's because he developed confidence in Rudy. I don't know this. I'm just speculating. Confidence in Rudy from their interactions during the campaign. Rudy's a very talented person. Like, what, he can, what can he do in this situation? I don't know. I've seen this stuff about he's going to negotiate an end to the investigation. I don't know whether he, that's an accurate uh, reporting is of that, what. Is that really how it works? Not in my experience, no. <laughs> uh, and nor would a relationship, I don't know what the relationship is between Bob Mueller and Rudy Giuliani, but nor would a relationship matter. It, it just doesn't make any difference. And so I don't know what, what it means. As Deputy Attorney General, you appointed Patrick Fitzgerald, the special counsel in the Scooter Libby case. What do you make of President Trump's pardon of Scooter Libby, and do you think that was a message to Michael Cohen or others? I think it's an attack on the rule of law. There's a reason that President George W. Bush, for whom Scooter Libby worked, declined to pardon him after a deep review of all the facts. President Bush concluded that justice was done, the rule of law system worked here. He, as an act of mercy, he commuted his sentence, but to now have a president 12, 14 years later say he deserves to be pardoned with no review and no consultation, as best I can tell, with the prosecutors or the investigators, I can't think of a sensible rule, a reason consistent with the rule of law to do that. So I think it's an attack on the rule of law. Whether it's a message of anybody in particular, I don't know. Somebody asked me 
you know, was it a message to me? And my wife reminded me, it's not about you, dear. Um, I don't know whether it's a message, but it, it is a, even if it's not a message to anybody, it's an attack on the rule of law, because it's really important that people be prosecuted for lying blatantly, which is what that was, in the criminal justice system, because without that, the rule of law just melts away. What would happen to the investigation if President Trump issued preemptive pardons? I don't know. As, That's all the time we have. Thank you. <laughs> uh, do, uh, uh, can you imagine that happening? Like, does that sound, uh, does that look possible to you? Sure. Yeah. The world we're in, I can't imagine myself saying that in any other environment, but it, sure, it's possible. And I don't know what the effect would be, though, because I don't know enough about preemptive pardons, and I also don't know to what extent are there, I just, smarter people would have to answer this for you than I, but are there, if you preemptively pardon someone, does it depend upon the description of the pardon, and are there room for state action? Is there room for additional federal action? I just don't know. So based on what's happened, the fact that you think that's possible is remarkable. Like, based on what's happened before, why do you think that that's possible? Or as you say, like, solely in this environment, could you imagine that? Right, solely in this environment, where you have a president who is actively undermining the rule of law and the institutions that we count on, no matter what your political affiliation is, we count on as a country to uphold this democracy. And the routine attacks on the Justice Department, the FBI, the courts, <coughs> at least to me, and the quick condemnation of the FBI for acting like thugs, allegedly, when executing a court-ordered search warrant, all of that together, along with the president's uh, habit of not telling the truth repeatedly tells me this is a president that might do something like that. Uh, for those who are tweeting along at hashtag Axios Comey, uh, that's a good tweet. What do you think of President Trump's red line saying the special counsel should stay away from his family finances? <coughs> I don't know what to make of it. Well, are, are those fair game in an investigation like this? Is it fair game for an investigator to look at finances? Sure, it depends upon whether it's logically connected to the subject of the investigation. Because uh, reporting shows the president reacted extremely viscerally when he found out that there had been subpoenas about financial matters. I read the reporting. I don't know whether the reporting was accurate. I also don't know what was behind his reaction. Uh, are you surprised that these issues didn't come up for the president when he was in business, before he was in office? Which issues? Uh, uh, issues about personal finances. Well, I gather they were a substantial feature of his life in bankruptcies and other things. So I, personal finances have been a big, I, I don't know exactly what your question is, but personal finances have been a big part of his personal finances. <laughs> so uh, no one can get inside Robert Mueller's head better than you. You told Chuck Todd yesterday that you're duty bound not to talk about anything you learned during the investigation. So talking here only about what's been made public since your departure on May 9th, so it's 10 days till your big anniversary. Um, uh, the special counsel- It's my paper anniversary, I think. Yeah. Uh, the special counsel was named a, a week after that. Um, from the public clues, filings, pleas, indictments, what do you find most instructive about this investigation and where it's going? I can't offer that view, because I can't separate in my head my my characterization of facts that occurred after May 9th and before, so I can't answer that. So as you look at your... And you can see in the book, I've tried not to talk about the investigation in the book. So you're a huge news consumer. As you look at coverage of the investigation, what does the media get too hopped up about, and what do we maybe overlook or value less than an experienced eye would? I worry that the media, and or, or people consuming the media, doesn't people don't realize that nothing is coming from the people who know what they're talking about. <laughs> and, and that's not, that's not the, that's, I'm not picking on the media, that's not the media's fault, but the sources are defense lawyers, people around them, in my experience, and not Robert Mueller's operation, which I think is tight as a drum. And so none of us know what's going on in Director Mueller's investigation. 
When you were in office, did you ever leak? No. And in other interviews, you have seemed to define leak only as classified information, but there's plenty of leaks that can be non-classified. What is your definition of leak? An unauthorized, a disclosure of protected information. Yes. You're right, it can be broader than classified information, grand jury information, sensitive personal information, but something that you're not supposed to give out to the media by rule and by statute. And you never did that? Nope. Why did you give those memos to Benjamin Wittes instead of just giving them straight to the New York Times? I didn't give them to Benjamin Wittes. I'm sorry. I gave a memo to one person, Daniel Richmond. Yeah, that's right. And why did you not do it straight to the New York Times? Because I thought if I do it directly, as I think I said when I testified about this, it'll be like feeding seagulls at the beach, because I have this huge crowd of journalists at the end of my driveway, and how will I, how will I say no comment and no, how will I avoid any reaction with awesome people like you? And so. <laughs> so you were concerned about our feelings? Your feelings? No, no, just about my ability to stay away from you. <laughs> uh, fair enough, all right. You struggled with sensitivities around elections. It's 190 days till the midterm elections where Robert Mueller's findings could be a big deal. Do you think he'll take that into account in his pace and release an announcement? I don't know. He, he likely will because of the norms of the Department of Justice. Despite what you've read or, or heard, there aren't any rules around how we act in the run-up to an election. There's a memo from 2012 about election-related crimes that I keep seeing journalists hyperlink to, like that's the rules, that's not the rules. There's a norm. You avoid any action in the run-up to an election that might have an impact if you can. And so I'm sure he'll operate with that norm in mind. Now whether, what conduct that will drive is harder to say. And how would you adjust to that? Like, would there be a quiet period, or do you assume they'll get things done soon? Or how do those norms play out when you've got a 190-day deadline? Well, I can't answer in this case, because you need to be able to see, have a vision for where the investigation is going and whether you can responsibly conclude it you know, well in advance of an election or whether it will reasonably, even by its own course, carry you beyond the election. And so you don't make the decision based on the election. But you look at the investigation and the election, and you say, OK, all else being equal, can I responsibly avoid a public action that might have an impact? So it's difficult to answer other than that abstract way. What advice would you give him about coming out and saying something? It's worked well for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Touche. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, well. <laughs> Uh, I don't have any, he doesn't need my advice on that, because this norm was part of my existence as a federal prosecutor, as FBI director, so I'm sure it's part of his existence as well. And you can't give advice on that without knowing what are the alternatives. What could he reasonably avoid? What is unavoidable? And you can't say that from the outside. In your very brief, uh, quickie interview with George Stephanopoulos, uh, you said that President Trump shouldn't be impeached. That would be letting the voters off too easy. The voters should do that. Uh, should make that uh, decision themselves. I think in some of your other interviews, you seem to have calibrated that slightly. What is your current view on whether or not President Trump should be impeached? Yeah, what I meant, and I, and I think I screwed this up with George Stephanopoulos, what I meant to express was a sense that, of course, I didn't say this to him, but of course impeachment should follow the law and the facts. It's a process laid out in our Constitution. I'm a huge supporter of the rule of law. That should go wherever the facts and the law take it. What I was trying to express to him was a sense of, that I have that, in a way, that would be too bad for a couple reasons. First, if President Trump were impeached and convicted, removed from office, it would drive a dysfunction and divide deep into our public culture that would take us a long time to fix. And I think it would let the voters off the hook. I think the American people, without regard to their political stripe, need to stand up and say, forget guns, forget taxes, forget Supreme Court justices. Something matters that is above those, and that is that our leader reflect our values. So that's a... <laughs> but that's super interesting. That is different. You think the process would be bad for America? I think in ways, in many ways, the process would drive, would create a sense of illegitimacy 
among a big part of uh, supporters of President Trump that would be difficult to unwind. And that would, that's what I meant by drive our division deep into our fabric. And that a healthier way, in many ways, to resolve this is that the American people, especially those who don't normally vote, stand up and say, this is what we stand for. That moment of clarity and inflection would be very good for America. And if you look at history of our political division, we cyclically find times where we have terrible political division. And something resets us. Often it's a cataclysm of some sort, right? World War II arguably reset a lot of the dysfunction and divide of the 1930s. Surely we don't need that. And that the moment of clarity would come from an election is what my hope. What are the chances President Trump will be on the ballot in 2020? I have no idea. Can I ask you? <laughs> Uh, what, what are the chances? Apparently he, not. <laughs> what are the chances? He, what are the chances he wins? The chances that he wins? I don't know that either. Well, you don't know, but what do you think? I, it would depend upon, I'm sure, about things that I'm not an expert in. But whether there's a third party candidate, what, how does the electorate split? All those kinds of things. Okay, I, I want to cross one D on things you don't know. Uh, you said you don't know if he's going to give an interview to Robert Mueller. I get that you don't know, but like, is it more likely or less likely? What does it look like to you? In a normal world, <laughs> it would be very hard for the President of the United States not to submit to an interview in connection with an investigation that touches upon the conduct, his conduct, and that of people around him. And the, in a normal world, the American people would find that very, very difficult to accept. I'm only hesitating because we don't live in that world, and so I don't know whether there's so many norms have been broken that disturb me greatly. As you've heard me say, on a regular basis, the president tweets that I should be in jail, and even I go, eh, right? <laughs> uh, and that's crazy, right? Close your eyes. I keep saying to Republicans, close your eyes and imagine Barack Obama waking up some morning and saying that it, somebody doesn't like should be in jail. Republicans would freak out about that. And so where is that? So that's, so that's a long way of saying, that's why I say I don't know. In a normal world, everyone would freak out, but I don't know. But you think he should? <laughs> so in what capacity are you asking me that? As an American citizen, I would expect my president to respect the rule of law enough, first of all, not to attack the administration of justice on a regular basis, and to cooperate with a lawful, appropriate investigation. That's what I would expect. Should Hillary Clinton have been charged with a crime? No. When she was interviewed, why wasn't she put under oath? It didn't matter whether she was under oath. The same thing I talked about with the, an interview of President Trump. Whether you're under oath or not, it's still a crime to lie during that interview. And so it's inconsequential in terms of the strategy of the interviewers. Do you wish she'd won? Do I wish she'd won? <laughs> Yeah, I, that's one I'm not going to answer, I don't think. What, because you've said your family members do. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> what would your life be like if she'd won? I also don't know the answer to that. I think I would still be the FBI director. <laughs> and the reason I say that is, Someone asked me to compare the two, and it's, it's too hard for me to compare the two, except Secretary Clinton is someone deeply enmeshed, enmeshed in the rule of law, respect for institutions, a lawyer. And so given that background, I'm reasonably confident that even though she was unhappy with decisions the FBI had made, she would not fire the FBI director as a result. But look, again, I don't, I don't know that for sure. So you write about the earlier your earlier career as a prosecutor against the mob, and you talk about the silent circle of assent around mafia bosses, their enablers and accomplices. Who are those people for President Trump? I'm not prepared to answer that one, Mike. <laughs> but, and I meant that, I, I do think that resonates for me, that's why I wrote it, about President Trump and the culture of his leadership, but I've seen it in a lot of other environments investigated and prosecuted a lot of corporate fraud. That was a familiar feature of a um, leadership of a corporation that was engaged in criminal misconduct, that 
silent circle of assent. The boss is in control, will do what the boss says. Who do you admire who's around President Trump? I admire uh, Jim Mattis a great deal and believe he's an American patriot and, and get up every morning hoping he's getting up that same morning. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and for a long time, I've worked closely as FBI director with John Kelly when he was head of Southern Command and developed a very positive relationship with him. You've studied the dossier closely. Does it appear that it's more accurate than inaccurate? Hmm. I can't sort it for you that way. What I can say is a core feature of the so-called dossier was an allegation that was richly corroborated by other intelligence gathered by the intelligence community, namely that the Russians were engaged in a comprehensive effort to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. I think of that as the hub of the dossier. There are a variety of spokes that it's tough to sort out. The work was underway when I left to try and see how much of that we could rule in or rule out, and, and so I can't say. But it could all be true? Sure, I'm trying to go through all of it in my head, but it, it could in large measure be true, it could in large measure be false. So there's a question from Ed Hunter, who's here tonight. How concerned should we personally be about cybersecurity? Beyond terrorism, are our investments and bank accounts safe? This is a, I'm gonna give you a useless answer. You should be very concerned that <laughs> because we've connected our entire lives to the internet, not just our, our financial worlds, but our health worlds and our social worlds. It's where everybody who wants to hurt us on those dimensions comes. And the challenge, first of all, the internet is not designed for security, and it's only as good, frankly, as the weakest human in the link, in the chain. We, we miss you, the weakest human link in the chain. So yes, you should be deeply concerned. That said, I think there's reasonable security. You can't be secure. You can be more secure and less secure. There's reasonable security in America's financial institutions. How alarmed should we be about the infiltration of Facebook? Alarmed on a number of levels. That is that, and this touches on a topic I'm not expert in. I'm sure there's people here who could talk about it much better than I, but there is the ability of people to participate and shape our, not just our individual lives, but our public dialogue is profound and figuring out how to stop it is really hard. As a clear and present danger to the United States, how high do you rate those platforms given how easy they are to manipulate? What's the scale? I can make it up? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how high would I rate the danger? probably compared to other dangers that I worry about or used to be paid to worry about, I'd say medium. Should there have been an earlier reckoning for the tech companies, earlier accountability? I can't answer that. And I mean, I, I can't answer that thoughtfully, so I won't try. How fixable are the holes in these platforms? I don't know. I'm, I'm skeptical. I worry that the nature of them is such that it is, that, that it, the notion of a fix may be um, an illusion. So uh, ABC's Jonathan Carl is here. He's my lifeline. Uh, he's going to do a little uh, uh, follow-up here in just you're, a second. You're phoning a friend. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but before I phone my friend, uh, when was the last time you talked to Andrew McCabe? Hmm. Probably a month ago. What do you think of what happened to him? I'm, I'm conflicted. I think he is a great person and public servant. I feel pain for him and his family. At the same time, though, I think the Inspector General's report and that process shows people, I hope it shows people, this is what an organization committed to the truth and accountability looks like. Whether the result with Andy causes you pain or it's something that you like, this is what an organization looks like that cares deeply about telling the truth. And adding to the conflict is, the way the president behaved in connection with that was shameful. That he managed somehow to stain, not just harm Andy and his spouse, who is an entirely separate human being, despite the fact they talked about like she's an appendage of his, and, and 
stain them and stain the Department of Justice and the FBI and the Inspector General process by the way in which he conducted himself. And so it's a tragedy on so many levels, not just for the McCabe's, but for the institutions of justice. So that's why I'm, I'm conflicted about it. Lessons for leaders. What's the biggest mistake you made as FBI director that didn't involve a Clinton or a Trump? If I'm answering, do I, am I conceding that I made mistakes in connection with those matters? <laughs> no, just, uh, just. I see, okay. Yeah. Just want to be lawyerly on you. Uh, I made a ton, I made a ton of mistakes. Um, I made a bunch of personnel mistakes. I carelessly created a problem with the government of Poland. It, <laughs> it's the truth. Uh, in a speech I was giving about the Holocaust, and it was a distraction and just a boneheaded play by me. I think I entered the debate about encryption in a stupid way. That I, I talked about my tendency to, to react too quickly. I saw these news advertisements that Apple and Google were advertising you know, basically warrant proof phones, like that was a great thing. And instead of stepping back and thinking about it carefully and what I wanted to say, I went right into a press round table and bang, I hit them. And then we were off to the races. And so, I don't know how much time you have, Mike, but there's, I can think of others as I sit here. Uh, ABC's Jonathan Carl, I appreciate uh, him here. I'm phoning him uh, for the uh, obvious follow-ups that I should have asked. John? Um, just first, a, a clarification. Thank you, Director Comey, for doing this, Thanks, taking John. these questions. Um, you said that even if you learned decisively uh, that your actions swung the election, you wouldn't do anything differently. Is that, do I have that right? Yeah. Even, as crazy as that sounds, yeah, because the choice I faced in late October, as I saw it, was between a really bad option and a catastrophic option. And, and you can't make that decision, weighing in that decision whose electoral prospects we affected and in, in what way. You have to decide. So given the values of this institution, what is the right thing to do here? And one of my best people asked during that whole process, should you consider that what you're about to do may help elect Donald Trump president? In essence, ask this question. And I thanked her for asking the question, and I said, great question, but not for a moment, because down that path lies the death of the FBI as an independent entity. Because once we start considering, so who will this help and hurt, we're just part of the partisan tribal warfare. And so that's why, I, I know that answer sounds bracing to people, but that's why I give it. So yes. Well, I would think one thing you could ask is just how do we not help or hurt either candidate? Well, you know that what you're going to do will have some impact on the election, right? Because the norm is if you can avoid it. And so the situation I faced on October 28th was I couldn't find a door that said here is no action. I could see two doors. Each was an action. I could speak or I could conceal the fact that we were restarting an investigation in a hugely significant way, having told the American people repeatedly they could count on the fact that we were finished and had done a great job, and even though everybody complained from one's part of the spectrum, there was no there there. And so either way, we were gonna have an impact of some sort. And so my judgment was, we have to push that aside and just say, okay, given those two options, which is the least bad given this institution and its role in American life? Okay, um, I've got a stupid question very quickly, and then a question about pardons. Um, I, what would it take for the special counsel to get access to President Trump's tax returns? Would that have to be something that the president himself would have to turn over, or uh, could the special counsel go to the IRS separately? Yeah, I don't, I'm not going to comment on this case in particular, but in general, you can get a court order for the production of tax returns. There's a process inside the Department of Justice to have that reviewed and approved, but it does not require the consent of the taxpayer. Okay, because we've been trying to get those tax returns. So. <laughs> um, and, and, I don't uh, think that Justice Department process includes you, John. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, and then finally, on, on the pardon question that Mike asked, uh, the example would be Richard Nixon, I mean, Ford's pardon of Nixon, where Ford pardoned Nixon for any activities uh, between January 20th of uh, 1969 and August of, of uh, 1974. So if the president were to pardon, say, Michael Cohen for any activities from the day he started working for the Trump Organization till, say, today, would that 
do away with Michael Cohen as a figure in this investigation, or would it, uh, what, what kind of an impact would that have? Because I, I assume he could still be called as a witness and he could no longer take the fifth. Yeah, that's a tricky one. And I, so I haven't given a quality thought, but maybe I can answer in general, that once a witness is pardoned, they wouldn't have a Fifth Amendment right to assert. I'm just hesitating because they might credibly assert there's fear of local or state prosecution. But in general, if you focus just on the federal, they wouldn't be able to resist becoming a witness. And then if they committed, if they lied, made false statements, or committed perjury as a witness, they could be prosecuted for that. But then, of course, they could be pardoned for that. And so I, I, I have not thought about it well enough. But that, that is how it would go in general. They could be compelled to be as a witness after that. And John, I'm sorry, go ahead. But, 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 a, a, but a pardon wouldn't necessarily end him as a figure in the investigation, or even a wave of pardons wouldn't necessarily end the investigation into the president. Not necessarily. In any, again, if a, if a witness, potential defendant slash witness is pardoned in a criminal investigation, they could then no longer be a defendant in that investigation, but they could be compelled to testify. And John, one more T you can cross, and then we're going to go to the cards. I thought it was very interesting what Director Comey was saying about the midterms and the norms of not interfering and how that um, might affect Mueller. Like, do you just want to follow uh, once on that? Because yeah, I know I, mean, it, I know it I caught mean, your ears too. Yeah, so. Are you encouraging him to ask me questions? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I remember well when Ken Starr issued his report. Uh, and it was in, you know, many, many boxes of, of supporting materials that were literally dumped on the House side of the, of the, of the Capitol. Um, Robert Mueller is going to make a decision not dissimilar to your decision about, uh, you know, w what to do. Is he going to simply do nothing and blow past the midterms? He's got a lot of evidence already right now that would be highly relevant to to voters in the midterm elections. And so it requires a judgment call. Norms are inherently a little bit ambiguous. And so guided by that desire to not be involved in election, make a judgment call as to what can I responsibly do and when, given where I am in the investigation. That's why it's so hard for me to answer. I don't, in late October, I could not find a way to avoid an action, even if I, and I desperately wanted to, but I don't know what his degrees of freedom will be, because no one except people on his team know where he is in this investigation. So uh, I want to pause and say uh, what a great audience this is. It was very, uh, very impressive how many people lined up, how long. And these questions are very like sincere and thoughtful questions. When I start, I'm asking this because uh, Alex K is a 15-year-old from the lab school. And Alex K says, at what point did you lose your respect and trust for Trump? Who let that kid in here? <laughs> uh, I, my concerns about the president's commitment to telling the truth, um, sort of it, it was a process over time, really. I was concerned about it enough that it was important to document my first meeting. But there was also another concern there. I wanted to make sure the intelligence chiefs who hadn't been there with me had an accounting of the, the meeting, because they had left before I had to do the private piece. Thereafter, it was increasingly a concern on my part that I was interacting with him about things that touched him personally, that touched the FBI and me, my, our responsibilities, and that he might lie about them. And so it was a process, pretty quick process, but a process that I would say by the by late January, I was very concerned about it. What type of prayers did you use to strengthen yourself? And this person adds a note. In November of 2016, I told one of your assistant directors that retired FBI direct, excuse me, that retired FBI agents like myself were praying for you. I am a um, fan of philosopher theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, who wrote the Serenity Prayer, which is, um, was <laughs> brought to my mind many times in the course of the last two years. And so looking for the wisdom to accept and the patience to accept that which I can't change and the courage to change what I can uh, was really important to me. This is signed a freshman at GW. What type of legal repercussions would arise if President Trump decided to fire Robert Mueller? I don't know. That's a really interesting question, because I think there's a good argument to be made 
that it would be utterly ineffective in practice, that you'd have to fire the entire FBI and the entire Justice Department for two reasons. First, that, that I don't know that if the President followed the normal course, he would be able to find an executive who would carry out an order to fire Robert Mueller. And so then maybe he does away with the regulation that appointed Mueller and then fires him. But something really interesting might happen then, because I, there is no deep state, but there's a deep culture and commitment to the rule of law that runs all the way down through not just the Department of Justice and the FBI, but the military services and the, and the intelligence community. It would be interesting to see what would happen next, because I could imagine U.S. attorney's offices picking up pieces of it, different FBI offices picking up pieces of it. It would be very hard to do something that was that direct an attack on the rule of law, given the culture, which is the ballast in this country. So you're saying, you're saying dear President Trump, don't bother? Yeah, I think, it, first of all, it, I would hope it would be disastrous in the eyes of the American people without regard to their political affiliation, but it would also be ineffective. And so don't do disastrous things at all. Don't do disastrous things that won't make a difference. This is a question from Nathan and Anna. They say, Director Comey, can you describe your working relationship with Vice President Dick Cheney? Tense. <laughs> yeah, we had some, uh, again, he seems like another very smart person, but we had a conflict that was intense especially over the NSA surveillance program, Stellar Wind. And I, I tell the story in the book, so I won't repeat it here, but he looked me in the eye closer than we are and told me that thousands of people were going to die because of what I was doing. And what I was doing was supporting the lawyers at the Office of Legal Counsel who said we cannot find a legal basis for much of this activity. And I said to him, that's not helping me. That's just increasing the pain. I, I, it doesn't help me think differently about the legal problem. Who is, a le who is a living leader that you admire? Well, Clapper, I mentioned. I You've taken him. that one. I admire him a great deal. I imagine that. And I'll tell you a surprise there. I, I came to admire Barack Obama. I was not a... I was not, I was not a political supporter of Barack Obama. I gave money to McCain. I gave money to Romney, in part because they hounded me. but. But also, I thought it was important that people of principle be the nominee from the other party. I worried that wing nuts might take over that party. Huh. Um, <laughs> and, and, but I came, my dealings with him were on national security issues. And I came to respect not only the decisions he made, but the way he made decisions, and especially that ability to listen and to create an environment where people would speak to him. That man would listen for five or 10 minutes without interruption, and not just when Joe Biden was talking, but he, <laughs> he would listen, and then he would ask questions drawn from the first minute, the third minute, the fifth minute. It was extraordinary. He was listening and wanted to get it out of you so then he could learn from it. Extraordinary. And so I became, I became an admirer of him as a leader. Who's a leader you admire? Who's a leader you admire in business or philanthropy or academia? I worked for a great CEO at Lockheed Martin named Bob Stevens, who came from the humblest of circumstances, was a grunt marine in Vietnam, we got his first job helping build aircraft and grew up to be the CEO of Lockheed Martin and never lost that ability to connect to people and to try and get the truth from them. So I admire him a lot. And I'll stop there. This, I, in case I left anyone off the list, I was going to say you next. <laughs> Did Bill Clinton's meeting with Loretta Lynch influence your decision to hold the press conference in the summer of 16? Yes, it was the capper. It, it wasn't, it was the meeting in conjunction with Loretta, who I like very much, I've known a long time, Loretta's decision to announce that she would not recuse herself but would accept my recommendation and that of the career prosecutors. And at that point, I decided, as much as I like Loretta, this result will not have credibility with the American people if I announce it standing next to her. And so, never thought I'd be in, I thought of this as a 500-year flood, never thought I'd be in this situation. But given where we are, again, bad and worse, worse would be standing there and having the American people have corrosive doubts about the credibility of the work by the Obama Justice Department, 
bad would be stepping away and announcing that recommendation. She said she would accept, but doing it separately. And so people can disagree about this, but we thought at the FBI, we've got to do bad. We can't do worse. BuzzFeed has a story saying that the Justice Department was looking at taking out of the prosecutor's manual the language about the freedom of the press. I saw that, and I'd want to know more about that before I got too whipped up. And, and so I just don't know. I saw the headline or saw the story, but I don't know whether it's real. And, and I, you know this because you've covered institutions. When, when a big institution, whenever you have a choice between malevolence and incompetence, always start with incompetence <laughs> and realize they might be repairing the website or something. And, and so I don't, I don't want to leap to malevolence. So putting aside the motive, you clearly don't think it's a good idea. To put aside freedom of the press? No, to, t to put aside, to take the language out of their manual. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what the language is. You'd want respect for the news gathering and reporting function to be central to your investigative considerations. Reasonable people can disagree about how you interact with the media, but prosecutors and investigators ought to have it front of mind when touching the media. I told you these questions were very thoughtful, sincere. What advice do you have for current government employees on how to stay focused on the mission while under political pressure? Uh, uh, take the long view. Remember, someday you will have to explain to your grandchildren what you did during this time. And and it's what helped me during moments when I thought I was going to be crushed by pressure. I would close my eyes and float to the future and say, so how will I explain this? I gave in to what? Because they yelled at me? I gave in because I was under pressure? Remember what the values are of this institution that you serve, whatever it is, and remember someday you're going to have to explain how you upheld those values. And that should give you strength. So uh, we have an advice question here, if you don't mind doing your uh, Dear Abby, your Ann Landers. Uh, you've said that you hate, you've said that you don't hate Donald Trump. Given what he said about you, that's impressive. <laughs> Could you please help me not to hate Donald Trump? <laughs> Thanks much. Two exclamation marks. Hating people gives them too much power over you. And, And one of the real dangers we face today is that the president's behavior will drag us all down. And, and so look, I'm not much on Twitter, but I'm, I'm keen not to engage in back and forths on Twitter and name calling. And whether or not there's a space between slime and ball, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> that, that it's really important that we remember who we are. And remember, again, you're going to explain to your grandchildren someday, I acted this way. And so hating someone, there are people you need to hate, but I would urge you first, hate their actions, and don't give the person that central a role in your life. Uh, we have another hashtag here. So in addition to hashtag Axios Comey, uh, Director Comey, did you get the letters from your former colleagues at the FBI? Do you know we miss you? Did you read them? Signed, FBI employee with the hashtag Homies, homies. Uh, I read every one, and I could only, you, you all made me cry. I, I could only read them like 20 at a time. I'm, you probably have some sense of how many I got. I have drawers full of them, and uh, it increased my pain, but also uh, made me realize why I loved, why I felt that pain, because of the people. I loved the people. Drawers full of letters from former colleagues oh, yeah. at the FBI. Yeah. And cards and hilarious pictures and T-shirts and mugs. Uh, by the way, I get no piece of a Comey's My Homie shirt, a Comey's My Homie mug. <laughs> yeah. Lordy, I hope there are tapes. I get none of that. <laughs> but they sent me, look, I said this when I testified, it's a lie that the FBI was in tatters. It's a lie that I was estranged from that workforce. One of the proudest parts of my life was I love those people, and I think in the main, they felt it back. And so it meant a lot to me that all these things came in, but it was very painful. But I promise you, I read every one. If you sent me a card, I read it, and I still have it in my basement. We're about to get the...
Uh, we're about to get the hook here, but uh, this is another personal one I had to read. What is something you would like to share with the people of the Bureau now that it's been just under a year since dot, dot, dot? Many of us remember that day, and we likely won't forget it. Never forget just how strong the culture of that organization is. And that's frustrating when you're a director who's trying to orient it in certain ways, but minor ways. But remember that that inertia is your strength and the strength of this country. That people who haven't been there, when I describe that culture as ballast for America, if you haven't worked in the United States military services or in the intelligence community or in the FBI or the Justice Department, maybe you don't get it. But all of you who've worked there and are working there now, you feel it. And no president serves long enough to destroy that. And so just remember the long run, remember who you are, and again, remember how proud you're gonna to be to tell your grandchildren what you were like during this period of time. So you are great, just keep being it. This is the last uh, card and then I have a goodbye question. 200 years from now, when a historian gets to write the story of the 2016 election and the beginning of the Trump administration, what will he or she say about you? He was tall. Uh, you were 6'8", uh, the other day somebody asked you who would play you in the movie and you said? Somebody much shorter. <laughs> uh, so, Weird uh, camera angles, yeah. Uh, you should keep these, these are cool. Wow. Uh, uh, goodbye question here, there's a question from Sally Quinn. How is your family handling this? The fact that you're hated by left and right. Thank you for that predication. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing okay, my kids, Fine, because we've worked really hard. All families have their own microculture to make ours that dad is not the center of our family. And we compartmentalize. And they're like, oh yeah, dad, okay, great. And we talk about the next thing. Hardest for my wife, because she watches more than I, and it gets her jazzed up. She was given an interview with George Stephanopoulos, and he said, have you lost friends over this? And she said, not, not true friends. But yes, we've lost some. And after we were done, I said, who's on that list? <laughs> and she said, I have a list. I have a list. So it's hardest for her, and she's the one I worry about the most in that. You're rich now. How are you going to spend it? <laughs> I had a fair amount of dough before this, uh, because I was eight years in the private sector. Uh, what I will do is remember all of us, if you're in this audience, you are fortunate as against most of the world. Remember our obligation to, to care for those who don't have what we have. I'm not gonna talk or brag about what I do. So you'll never see my tax returns, but you would see that commitment reflected there. A term that you might have coined, it's good for the trend uh, writers uh, around here, uh, your family is upsizing. Yes, I have no idea why. Uh, my youngest is about to graduate from high school, we have five kids, and so my wife decided we need to move to a bigger house. <laughs> because, and this, we were gonna do this when I was director, and so uh, the idea is we have to have a place where each of them and their significant other can stay and room for the grandchildren and a ping pong table. We have to attract them all. We don't have any grandchildren, by the way. But, <laughs> but my wife is a planner, and so the idea is we will become an attractant to our big family, and we gotta do it now, because we've tried and fix it later. You get the story, you get it. And penultimate question, we've got 30 uh, seconds for two uh, questions. Uh, another question from Sally Quinn. The first line, the headline of your obituary or your epitaph. How do you want to be remembered is a probably nicer way. <laughs> uh, I actually don't care about this stuff in, in my epitaph. I, and if you know me, you know I mean this. I want to be a great father, a great husband, a great grandfather, and a good friend and neighbor. And the rest of it, I really don't, that can be down in the paragraphs, Mike, or not there at all, but that, that is my goal, is to be that. And I think my advice for young people would be, ask yourself that question, when I'm about to die, what will matter? 
because I guarantee you will not care about money or houses or cars or human honor or what newspaper clippings you have about yourself. It won't matter. So a quick thank you and then uh, the, and then the uh, goodbye uh, question. Thank Brad and Lissa and the team from Politics and Prose. Uh, thank Flatiron Books and uh, Javelin, the amazing team at Axios. Thank all of you for coming out. Thanks C-SPAN, and as we say goodbye, Director Comey, what's on your bucket list? What's one thing you've dreamed of doing that now you can? Hmm. I actually don't think there's anything on that list. I mean, I am a happy person. And maybe that explains why it, it, this doesn't bother me more, but I, I'm married to my best friend. I've got five amazing children. I, I actually don't have a bucket list. Director Comey, thanks for a great conversation. Yeah. Good night. See you on Axis.com. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir.